So, uh, hello everybody. I'm going to do something which is probably extremely foolish at, a, at an Erlang conference, and that's um, make a talk that has absolutely no Erlang in it of any variety whatsoever. Um, and the reason for that is that when I was speaking to uh, Francesco about um, coming to this, uh, this conference and presenting, um, he asked that I made a point of talking about the, the wider concurrency um, landscape. Um, now, I don't, I don't know you guys half as well as maybe I should, but, but um, one of the things he asserted was that the Erlang community as a group maybe sometimes gets a little bit insular. Um, there's wonderful things going on within the Erlang community, but there are some pretty interesting things going on outside the community as well. Um, and he wanted me to talk about some of those things that are going on outside Erlang, um, just to provide a little bit of um, uh, context that, that you guys uh, maybe will find useful in terms of, of just, just seeing what's going on elsewhere and maybe stealing some of the, uh, some of the better ideas that are out there. Um, so I, I think that the first thing which I, I need to make very clear is I'm absolutely not suggesting in anything that I say here that I think that any of these approaches are better than what goes on in Erlang, and I'm certainly not suggesting that it wouldn't be possible to do the same kinds of things in Erlang. In fact, I, I guess part of my hope is that you guys will see some things here that maybe you think are interesting, and that will inspire um, things within the Erlang community that, that maybe will we'll take things in, in new directions. Um, so there are really three key messages that, that I, want to, um, I want to get over here. Um, the first one is that there's a lot more to parallelism than just multiple cores. Multiple cores are really interesting, and I, I think multiple cores are particularly interesting in terms of some of the things that Bruce was talking about earlier. Because everybody in the, in the um, programming world is getting very excited about multiple cores and very worried about multiple cores, that's the opportunity for interesting languages like Erlang to increase in uh, popularity. But multiple cores aren't the complete picture. Parallelism is about a lot more than just multiple cores. So that's message one. Message two is that parallelism and concurrency aren't the same thing. They're certainly related to each other, but they aren't the same thing. And sometimes if we come at a parallel problem from a concurrent mindset, or we come at a concurrent problem from a parallel mindset, that can lead us down blind alleys. So that's message two. And the last... Um, the last message I want to, to convey is that there's more to concurrency than actors. Now, it's absolutely not me saying that actors aren't a very good solution to concurrency. I, I believe actors are an extremely good solution to concurrency. But there are other ways to tackle concurrent problems. And one of the things I want to do today is just show you some of those other approaches. Um, but I'm going to start by showing you probably the most hackneyed graph ever created um, in, uh, in talks about uh, uh, parallelism, which is good old Moore's Law. So everybody knows this. Number of transistors is doubling every 18 months. This obviously is a, um, a logarithmic scale. We've got a nice straight line. And right at the moment, that straight line looks like it's going to carry on being a straight line, certainly for as long as any of us can... Um, can predict with any certainty, and again, you've seen this many, many times, although the number of transistors is increasing, the um, performance of a single core kind of topped out sort of around 2005-ish, there or thereabouts, and this is what's giving us that well-known thing, the multi-core crisis. Now, like I say, this is a very hackneyed graph. I know you guys have seen this graph over and over again. Everybody concentrates on this end of the graph, but actually, there's something really interesting going on here. What the hell's going on there? Why is it that increasing the number of transistors from you know, somewhere around 10 to the 3 up to somewhere in the sort of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 mark, why does that make our computers go faster? I mean, if you've only got a single core, why does throwing more transistors at it make it go any faster? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Some of it is about increasing clock speed. As we make our transistors smaller, they get faster, and you know, if you've got a clock speed in the gigahertz instead of in the megahertz, obviously your programs are going to run faster. But that still doesn't tell you why more transistors are helping. That just tells you why smaller transistors are helping. Um, so part of it is bit-level parallelism. Why is an 8-bit computer slower than a 16-bit computer? 
Why is a 32-bit computer faster than both of them? Well, the answer is because it does more stuff in parallel. If you want to add two 32-bit numbers together, on a 32-bit computer, that's one operation. If you want to do the same thing on an 8-bit computer, you've got to do a whole series of operations in order to do your single addition. Um, but again, that's still only part of, the, um, part of the, the solution. And the main thing, the main reason why to date, or not to date actually, the main reason why up until fairly recently things have been getting faster is because down underneath our feet, these processes have been getting more and more parallel, and they've been getting parallel at the level of instructions. So you might write your code. You know, I'm talking about assembly level now. You might write move this value into that register, add these two registers together, branch if this register is less than zero, and it looks like what's going on is one thing at a time. But what's actually going on under the hood is a huge amount of parallelism. We've got branch prediction, we've got speculative execution, we've got pipelining. There's, there's all sorts of things which the chips have been doing in parallel. The clever thing about all of this is they've done it while maintaining the illusion that everything's running in series. Um, but that illusion, well, first off, it's, it's not working anymore because the chip designers have just run out of opportunities to, uh, to apply this parallelism in a way that um, seems to work for us. But it's also causing us grief now as we move to multiple cores. So now that, we, now that the chip designers are starting to, to cram more cores into these, um, these CPUs, um, the fact that all this parallelism is going on becomes a big deal. And in fact, that's a large part of the reason why multi-threaded programming is so hard. Everybody talks about deadlock and live lock and, and um, lock contention. But actually, there's a great deal more going, to, going on uh, under the scenes. So I want to um, present you guys with a, hang on a second. Um, sorry, we had all sorts of grief with the computer before I started. So I'm having to, to bring this up where I was hoped I had it before. So I'm going to show you guys a puzzle. Here is, can you read that? Is that large enough for you guys to read? Cool. Um, so it's, this is a really simple multi-threaded Java program. It's got two variables. We've got a Boolean and we've got an int, and we have two threads. First thread simply writes a number to our integer and then sets the flag. And the second thread checks the flag, and depending upon the value of the flag, prints a result. What can this program do? Come on, you guys are some of the best computer scientists in the world. What, what's the possible outcome, possible output from this program? Really? There's nobody in the room who's going to give this a go? Okay, well... <laughs> so we've got, we've got two, two variables. We've got a Boolean and we've got an int. Thread one is writing to the int and setting the flag. Thread two is checking the flag and either printing out the value of the, the int or saying, so, you're, you're ex so, so what you're saying is you think that one of two things is going to happen here, yes? Thank you. One of three things, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So we can get the obvious two answers. We can get a program which says the meaning of life is 42. We can also get the answer, I don't know the answer. But the really weird thing is we can get a third answer, and that is the meaning of life is zero. Now, how the hell can that happen? I mean, the only way that could happen is if the, the order of this um, line and that line gets flipped somehow, yeah? Well, the thing is, the order of those two lines can get flipped. Because we're dealing with concurrency here, and because the, the CPUs that we're running on are doing all this clever stuff, they're pipelining, they're doing speculative execution, they're doing branch prediction, down at the level of the, of the hardware, yeah, these two things really can happen in different orders. And because this, uh, this code doesn't have any synchronization in it, suddenly it's exposed to all this stuff, stuff we haven't had to worry about in the good old-fashioned sequential days, but really bite us in the ass hard when we're running in parallel. So I'm going to make another quick change to this, because it's not quite as simple as that. Let's imagine instead of this code, I've got uh, I'm going to do nothing in that loop, and then just... So what can that code do? And the two are? 
Ah, no, actually, there's another one as well here. This is even better. It could never terminate. Because there's absolutely no, again, we've got no synchronization here. It's quite possible for our compiler or our JIT or our CPU, any of those things, to take a look at that and say, well, the, 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 the thread that's writing to this value never uses it. So why the hell would I bother sticking it in memory? There's no reason why it has to be there, yeah. So this stuff is really complicated. Now, you guys don't care about this because you're using a sane language. The, the, reason why I'm, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that this is, this is where some of this clever stuff that's been going on under our feet for all of these years actually suddenly becomes noticeable. We can no longer pretend that our CPUs aren't running stuff in parallel under our feet. So. Fair enough. Um, let me go back to... Uh, so this stuff is going on, and it's stopped giving us value, which is why we've now got our multi-core crisis. But actually, this stuff has only stopped going on in one very specific area of computing. If we're talking about general purpose CPUs, you know, the, the Intel CPUs and the, and the ARM CPUs that we all use every day, yeah, this stuff has stopped giving value. But we use a lot of other bits of computing hardware. And in particular, we use graphics processing units. And in graphics processing units, this stuff's still going on. They're still seeing massive benefits from exactly this kind of, um, this kind of parallelism. So um, one thing that's going on is we're getting pipelining, yeah? So you, we tend to think of multiplying two numbers together as being a single, a single step. But if you're a hardware designer, if you're, right, if you're creating chips, what's actually going on is there's a whole series of operations here. And we can pipeline them so that um, we bring two operands in, those operands um, run their way through the pipeline, and I can have one set of operations at one stage in the pipeline and a different operation at a different end of the pipeline. So if we look here, for example, we've got multiplying two vectors together. Um, we can have the multiplication of um, uh, the seventh item of the vector and the multiplication of the sixth and the fifth and the fourth and the third, all going on in parallel. So if I've got, a say, a 10-element pipeline, I can have 10 things happening in parallel. The other thing that can happen is we can deal with much wider memory buses. So if we've got multiple ALUs within our, um, within our system um, and we've got nice wide memory buses so that we can, we can bring multiple uh, items out of memory simultaneously, we can combine pipelining inside the ALU with uh, multiple ARUs all running in parallel, and we get really, really good speedups. And the kind of speedups I'm talking about here aren't just multiplying your performance by, you know, three or four, which is what you might get by having three or four cores within your system. I'm talking about 10, 20, 30 times speedups here. The trick is, how do we program them? Now, if you're, if you're displaying graphics on your, um, on your screen, yeah, you get graphics on your screen. That's great, and that's all been done for you. But if you want to do number crunching, how do you how do you program these things? Well, one of the ways of doing it, probably the most popular way of doing it at the moment, is to use um, OpenCL, which is a language which is designed specifically for solving these kinds of problems. Um, so I just want to show you one very simple example of this. If we want to multiply two arrays, um, just straightforward, um, you know, one-dimensional arrays of data. Um, in OpenCL, what I would do, if I've got, let's say, a thousand items in my array, what I would do is I would create a thousand work items. And the work items are exactly as dumb as you imagine they might be. Um, it simply takes input A, input B, and writes to output. Um, and I'm going to show you the code here so you can, so you can see what I'm talking about. So where are we? We've got multiplier arrays. So this is our code. And it is really as dumb as you think it is. Um, now, the interesting thing about here is there's no, there's no parallelism here. I mean, you're seeing it, there's no threads being created. There's no synchronization. There's no nothing. We're literally just saying, in order to get from item I of input A and item I of input B to item I of output, this is what we do. Now, actually, OpenCL has some issues. So. The way in which you then run it is you have a driver program, which I'm not going to show you the damn thing, but there you go, there it is. So, you know, we're not talking about the simplest piece of code in the world, but the stuff that actually does the work, this stuff, genuinely is incredibly simple. And we get very real 
performance speed ups here. So just to show you I'm not making this up, if I go into um, So here we've got it. We've got um, this is this is a really simple case. So we're not going to get a huge speed up here because we're just doing simple multiplications. But that really simple piece of code gives us a two over two uh, two times um, performance increase. And if we go into something a little bit more interesting, like say um, matrix multiplication, which is a bit more complicated. Um, so here's our matrix multiplication, and I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but basically this is, this is exactly what you would normally expect for 2D matrix multiplication. We're just doing a, a loop within a loop, so um, we've, got a, we've got a single loop here, of course, because this, this work item is dealing with um, one element of our output, so kind of the, the outer loop has been hoisted into our driver code here. Um, but if I run this um, and time it, I'm getting an eight times speed up. And we're getting an eight times speed up on a completely commodity piece of hardware. You start running this on really serious bits of hardware. You know, you, you go buy um, a Mac Pro, for example, which has got, I think, four GPUs in it, something like that. You know, we, you can get 100 times speed ups really easily without actually having to write a thread, without having to write any synchronization. Um, you know, this, this is what these things are designed for. Now, there's a price to pay. There's a really serious price to pay because writing OpenCL code isn't a great deal of fun. But the point I'm trying to make is there are different ways in which you can exercise parallelism. Now, it gets even more interesting, potentially, when you start to look at some of the new um, parallel accelerators that are coming out. So the Parallela board, for example, um, kind of sort of looks like a GPU, but it also kind of sort of looks like a whole pile of CPUs. Um, and there's some really interesting work going on at the moment, I know, to get Erlang onto these systems. So what that means is, you Erlang guys are going to find yourself in direct competition with the OpenCL guys. You're going to be trying to target exactly the same pieces of hardware. And there are going to be cases where one approach is going to work better, and there are going to be cases where the other approach works better. I think it's going to be really interesting actually seeing how this, how this plays out and which are the kinds of problems where Erlang is the right solution and which are the kind of problems where OpenCL is the right solution. And is there some way in which we can start to use some of the, the, the much nicer Erlang development tools instead of some of the frankly dreadful OpenCL tools? So that's parallelism really in a very different way. But I accept not everybody's going to be writing um, GPU code any anytime soon. Um, so I'm going to take a look at, a, at another um, another type of parallelism, which this time is is aimed much more at the sort of traditional multiple CPUs. Um, so is anybody here a closure programmer? I'm going to write you some closure code. Is there anybody here who's yeah? We've we've got at least one. Okay. So it's going to be new to most of you, but um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so. Let's imagine I want to do um, a similar kind of thing. I want to take a whole bunch of, of integers and I want to add them all up together and, and I want to do it in parallel. Well, let's, let's start off by seeing what the um, sequential version of that would look like. Um, so line is the, um, the closure um, build tool and line REPL just starts me up a um, a, a command line REPL which I can type things at. Um, so I'm going to start by just getting myself a whole pile of numbers. So this is just a little tiny piece of, of closure which is going to give me an array that goes from 0 up to 10 million. So it's a dirty great big array full of numbers. And if I want to sum it, I'm going to use time which is just going to tell me how long this is going to take. Uh, reduce reduces. I think the equivalent of reduce in Erlang is fold. Is that right? I, yeah, cool. So this is this is a fold operation with the plus operator on numbers, um, and that is the result of summing all the numbers between um, zero and uh, and ten million. Um, I'm going to run it a couple of times because this is running on the JVM. So we've got to give the um, the JIT a little bit of time to, to kick in. So we're getting down to a number of around about 100 milliseconds to to perform this. Now. Closure provides this really nice thing called reducers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring that into namespace, which is so. 
So all I've done is just bring that into, into scope so that I can call it. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing again, except instead of reduce, I'm going to do r slash fold. Now, r slash fold reduces fold is basically just reduce. Um, just to make life interesting, they decided to give it a different name in the reducers namespace. Um, and if I run this, again, I'll run it a couple of times. Well, now we're down to 50 milliseconds. So simply by using a different version of, um, of the effectively the same library function, I'm getting, um, in this case, because again, it's a really simple example, something around a uh, two, you know, it's about a, almost exactly a two times speed up. Now, this is a, this is a two times speed up, which is genuinely just using the, the, the general purpose um, cores inside this machine. So how do we achieve that? So I'm going back to my, uh, back to my diagrams. What's going on under the hood is it's producing a tree like this. It's a reduction tree. Um, and the way, that it's, the way that it's working is it's, it's dividing the input array into a set of partitions. And these partitions, you know, we, we can control if we really want to exactly how large they are. But you know, broadly speaking, it's just choosing partitions which are kind of about the right size. And then it runs our uh, reduction um, function over each one of those in parallel. And then what it does is it merges them. Now, the interesting thing about the example we just saw is that this is an example where the thing that we use to, to reduce and then the thing that we use to combine actually is the same. If you're adding numbers, they boil down to the same thing. But I just want to show you a slightly more complicated example of this so that you can see um, how this might work in practice. And the, the thing I'm going to look at is a frequencies function. So uh, if I go back to our command line. I'm going to have a slightly different type of numbers. Um, so one of the things, just, just so you know, know what I'm doing, one of the things that Clojure provides um, is a function called rand int, which, as its name suggests, gives me a random integer. So each time I call this, I get a different number, in this case, between 0 and 10. Um, and I'm going to do So that's just going to give me, um, whoops, that's going to run forever is what that's going to do. Let's try that again. So that's going to give us 10 million random numbers, which you can see if I just do... So there we go. That's given us a dirty great big array of random numbers. Now, let's say I want to know what the frequency of each, each number is. I mean, I know it's going to be roughly one-tenth of the size of the array, but hey, they're random, so probably isn't exactly that. Now, Clojure provides us with a really nice function called frequencies, which we can pass to... And I'm going to time that as well. So there we are. We, I can tell you that we have got 998,932 instances of zero. We've got... Uh, uh, whatever it is, 1,153 instances of one and, and so on. And it took um, just over a thousand milliseconds. So let's do that a couple of times just to give the JIT a chance to, um, to make its mind up. So ooh, actually, we're getting slower. That's interesting. OK, so we've, we've kind of settled it around um, one and a half thousand milliseconds in, in order to do that. Um, now, I have in my code a parallel version of that. So here we are. So this again uses fold from the reducer's namespace. Um, but this time, it's passing two functions through. It's passing um, a function which is used to do the reduction. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through that in detail, because you guys aren't massively worried about the, the, the innards of, of closure, I'm sure. But effectively, what this is doing is it's building an array using a sock and incrementing it whenever it gets a new instance of a number. But then it's also doing a merge. And what it's doing is it's, it's merging the two array, uh, sorry, the two maps using addition whenever there's uh, the same key present in both maps. Um, so if we go back to our diagram, We've got a reduction at the top, which generates a map, given a, an array of numbers. And we've got a merge, which takes two um, maps and merges them together. Um, and if I 
try that. So the first thing I need to do is um, so I'm just going to change it from frequencies to parallel frequencies. And again, we'll run this a couple of times. So we've gone from about 1,400 milliseconds to about 400 milliseconds. So we've got ourselves a, a three, three and a bit times um, speed up. Um, now the interesting thing about this is again, there's no, there's no forking, there's no process creation, there's no nothing. I'm just operating on um, perfectly ordinary data structures. I'm just doing so using parallel operators instead of, um, instead of um, sequential operators. The other interesting thing about this, and this is kind of the, the key point about this, is because there's no synchronization, because there's no messaging, because there's no concurrency, well, there's no concurrency in the, the sense that we normally mean when we say concurrency, this is all completely deterministic. Uh, you, one, of the, one of the issues with concurrent programming is it introduces non-determinism. Now, sometimes that's exactly what you would expect. I mean, if you're dealing with a genuinely concurrent problem, I mean, you're, you're looking at bank accounts, you know, I really want a different result if two debits arrive for a, a thousand pounds. I want the first one to succeed, and because I don't have more than a thousand pounds in my account, I want the second one to fail. Uh, if they arrive in the other order, I want them to succeed and fail in a different order. I mean, that's, that's real, genuine non-determinism, which is a part of the problem you're trying to solve. But a lot of problems, particularly when we get into parallelism, you don't want them to be deterministic. I mean, the sum of all the numbers between naught and a mil the 10 million is the same answer every time. I don't want non-determinism in that. I want it to be exactly the same. And because what I'm dealing with here is parallelism, not concurrency, in this case, I'm getting, I'm getting that determinism that I, that I want. So I've spoken quite a bit about concurrency and parallelism. So what actually is the difference between the two things? Well, this is a quote from, from Rob Pike, um, who said, Concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once. Parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. Um, one of the ways that, that, um, that I like to explain this is in terms of um, my wife. My wife is a teacher. Um, now, because she's a teacher, like most teachers, she's extremely good at multitasking. Um, she can cope with being in a classroom with 30 kids around her. And yes, she might at any particular moment in time be trying to do one particular thing primarily. So she's listening to somebody read or she's talking to the class. But you know, if, if there's an argument breaks out on the other side of the class, she'll break off and deal with that. If some, some one of her children has a particular question, she'll answer that question. Now, that is a case of concurrency not parallelism. There's only one of her, but she's dealing with more than one thing in, uh, uh, concurrently. If we imagine a situation where she's joined by another adult, so she's got a teaching assistant who comes into the class, and one of them's listening to somebody read, and the other one is um, working with a, an individual child, now we've got something which is both parallel and concurrent, because there's um, multiple things happening, and they're all happening concurrently. But if you imagine a, a different situation, let's say, for example, um, the, the class has decided that it wants to make its own greetings cards, um, and they decide to set up an assembly line to, to manufacture those. Well, now we've got something which, if you view it from a high enough level, it's parallel, but it's not concurrent, because there's really only one thing going on. The fact that, that the multiple entities within the class are, are acting on it at any given moment in time doesn't really make it a concurrent problem. Um, another way of thinking about this, a slightly different, uh, different way of thinking about it, is that concurrency is an element of the problem domain. A concurrent problem is an intrinsically concurrent problem. I mean, the kind of problems that Erlang typically is, is used to solve, you're dealing with real concurrency. I mean, if you're writing a network switch and multiple things are arriving at the network switch at unpredictable moments, you really need to be able to handle them, in, handle them concurrently. Um, parallelism, though, is an aspect of the solution domain. Really, all we're trying to do when we write parallel code is trying to execute faster. We want a problem that would normally take, say, a second to operate in a tenth of a second because we bring 10 cores to bear on it. So they're related in the sense that they're, um, uh, they're both non-sequential 
down at the level of the code, but they're, they're kind of different things. And if we come at a parallel problem using concurrent tools, what we can do is we can bring a lot of the issues associated with concurrency into, into parallelism without necessarily wanting them there. So the big one being non-determinism. Um, so I've spoken quite a lot about, um, uh, about parallelism and concurrency. What I now want to do is go and look at specifically at, at concurrency. Um, and I want to look at, at two things. I want to look at two slightly different approaches to concurrent programming, which are, which are different from the Erlang approach. Um, again, just as a, as a compare and contrast. Um, so one of, the, one of the things which I want to look at is the, the closure approach. Now, I think that's interesting because it's fundamentally based on shared memory. Uh, which is completely different from the way that, that Erlang typically works. But it doesn't have most of the problems which we typically associate with shared memory programming. And the reason it doesn't have those problems is because closure is not a pure functional language, but is a mostly functional language. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a piece of code which is written in closure. Um, here it is. Now, this is an exceptionally simple web service. So this is the complete, this is every line of code of a Clojure web server. And what this Clojure web server is doing is it's maintaining a list of players in a tournament. So it's not a very, it's probably not the most useful web server you've ever seen. Um, and before we go through it in any kind of detail, um, I'll just show you it in action. So I'm just running my server there. When it started up, oops, have we started up yet? There we go, no, it started up. I'm going to talk to it using curl. So all this is doing is it's just doing an HTTP get on the, um, the URL I've given it, and it's returning the empty, um, the empty vector. So it's returning that to say, no, there aren't any players. So let's add a player. Um, so I'm going to do curl. So this is restful in the true sense of the word, if anybody who went to uh, the talk yesterday about what, what rest really was. So I'm going to add a player called Paul, and I'm going to add a player called George, and then if I get my players, I can see that I've now got two people in my list. So, you know, complex this isn't. The interesting thing is, if we go back to our code, what we've got is a list of players, which is, um, where are we? So this is, this is the, the, the function that's actually doing it. All we're doing is we're conging, which is um, closure for stick on the end of, um, the player name onto a vector. And this is a perfectly ordinary vector in shared memory. And it's running in parallel. I mean, I, I can't show you the fact that It'll cope if we if we hit it with multiple um, multiple clients simultaneously. You'll have to take my word for it. But it's running in parallel because this is running in a web server, and the web server handles multiple requests um, concurrently. So why is it that this doesn't give us any kind of um, uh, concurrency issues? Whereas if I tried to do the same thing, say in Java, and I just stuck things on the end of a um, of a vector, we would have those those same problems. Now, the answer is this little data structure here. And this is an atom, and an atom, as its name suggests, is an atomic variable. So this is the equivalent of just an ordinary variable in, in Java in Clojure, but it can be changed atomically. So if two different threads both try to change this, um, change this atom at the same time, one of them will succeed and the other one will retry. Now, that's all very well in itself, but why does this work? I mean, you, can, you could create that kind of data structure in Java, but actually using it would be, a, would be a complete nightmare. So what is it about Clojure that makes this work really nicely, whereas the same kind of approach wouldn't work in a language like Java? And the reason for that is that Clojure's data structures, because they're all functional, are persistent. So I'm, I'm sure most guys in this room, most of you... Oh, I, sorry, I shouldn't have said guys, actually, but it's on the, the keynote. But actually, it turns out I'm right, I think. Am I? I yeah, I, that's, that's a bit sad, but yes, I am right. But anyway, <laughs> most of you in the room, um, I'm sure, know about the persistent data structures. But just a quick recap. If we've got a list um, in this particular example, um, and I start off by adding something to that list, even though 
list v1 and list v2 appear to be different when I look at them, in memory, there's an awful lot of structure sharing going on. Similarly, if I um, drop something off the head and add something on the bottom, then again, we've still got a lot of structure sharing going on. So at this point, even though I've got three different lists, in memory, I've got a lot of structure sharing going on. And if I've got a pointer to any one of these, that pointer will remain valid for the whole of the life of the app. I'm never going to have stuff changing under my feet. And that's the reason why in a functional language like Clojure, we can make use of shared memory, and, but we can do so in a, in a very safe, uh, safe way, whereas trying to do the same kind of thing in an imperative language like, um, like Java would, would become problematic. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because um, it's very easy to get into the mindset of thinking um, Shared memory is bad. I mean, yet, there are lots of issues with shared memory. But it is possible to make shared memory work reasonably well. And Clojure is a good example of how it's possible to make shared memory work really well by using the power of, of um, functional programming in conjunction with it. The last thing I want to show you um, is... Oops, that's not what I meant to do. The last thing I want to show you is um, something which is maybe a little bit closer to, um, to your hearts and closer to the way that, that Erlang, uh, Erlang works. So what I've got here is a, is a diagram of kind of what an actor's program looks like. So each one of these little blobs is an actor. And an actor intrinsically is two things at the same time. It's both the thing that contains your code and, and the thing that executes, and it's a mailbox, which is the, the destination to which, addresses get, uh, to which messages get written. So this is typically what an actor program looks like. Now, there's another message passing approach called communicating sequential processes, which has a very, very similar kind of approach, but one key difference. And that key difference is it separates out these two things. So instead of having an actor which has a mailbox, in CSP you have processes, and then you have what CSP calls channels, which boil down to being mailboxes. But these two things are separate. And that leads to a somewhat different kind of design. So instead of getting that kind of shape program, you get this kind of shape program, where you've got, um, you've got processes and you've got mailboxes, and the two things are separate. Now, what does this matter, you think? Well, I just want to show you um, a CSP program, just to give you a feel for um, how it changes the the way that you would go about programming this. So let's go back. So I'm going to go... and get myself a uh, command line. Eventually. There we go. Um, so how do we actually talk to these things? Well, I'm going to create myself a channel. Um, and I'm going to thread is actually going to create me a separate thread. And I'm just going to read from my channel. Oops, there we go. So that's, that's fork to thread, and it's fork to thread which is going to read from a channel. You'll notice I haven't had any output from that thread, and the reason why I haven't had any output from that thread is because it's trying to read from this channel, and there's nothing to read. So let's write to it. And now I've written to it, and now I've got the output from my thread. Really simple stuff. Um, we can play with channels in a much more interesting way, though, because they're, they're first-class they're first entities. So in the same way as I can use functions like filter and map and, and all the rest of it on, say, um, arrays and, and streams, I can do the same kind of thing on channels. So um, what does this look like? Well, let's do define another channel. Um, and I'm going to use a little utility function called toChan. So what this does is it's defined a channel and automatically written onto that channel the result of range um, 0, 10, which, is gonna, which are the numbers between 0, zero and 10. Um, and just to prove that what's going on, I can read from it and I get the 0. I read from it again, I get 1. But there's this other really nice little function where I can do...
So async into is a little utility that's just going to read from the um, channel that it's given, put them into that, the data structure that's its first argument. And if I run that, I get what's left on the channel. And I can do um, interesting things here. So I can do something like def, you know, define a new channel. So same thing again, but this time I'm going to define a new channel. So filter less than is a version of filter that takes channels as its argument, and I'm going to pass it a function which it's a predicate which returns true if its uh, value uh, true if its argument is um, even false otherwise, and I give it that channel I created before, and now if I read from the channel, oops, that's not what I meant. Sorry. So if I read from that, I'm just going to get the even numbers because my filter that acted on channels um, is only going to return the even numbers. Now, this is a, this is a really different way of thinking about um, dealing, with, dealing with these things because they're first class. Um, I'm just going to show you kind of a... Sure, sure. Um, I was going to show you a um, fun little thing down this way. And I'm not suggesting that this is a... Um, this is a good way to solve this problem, but let's say we've got, we want to implement the sieve eratosthenes. Now, this is an implementation of the sieve eratosthenes that um, uh, uses channels. And actually, this is, I think, the purest implementation of the sieve eratosthenes I've ever seen. Most, you know, because the, the, the way that it's defined is you remove all the numbers um, that are multiples of your first prime, and then you remove all the numbers that are multiples of that, and then you remove all the numbers which are multiples of that. And when you actually implement it, what you tend to do is you go through the numbers one, one after the other and, and knock them out if they're in some list of primes that you've already seen. What this is doing um, is this. So actually, it's creating a channel which has got all the numbers from two up to infinity, and then it's creating another channel, which is that channel with all of the numbers which uh, are a factor of two removed. And then it creates another channel from that, which are all of the, uh, which have all of the numbers which are a factor of three removed, and then five, and so on. So this, this actually is a pure implementation of the sieve eratosthenes, and it's completely um, concurrent using, using channels. Um, and seeing as we're a little bit short of time, I, I won't go through the code in detail, but I guess what I wanted to, what I wanted to demonstrate here is that by taking the concept of a mailbox and separating it out from the concept of an actor, you can create a very different way of thinking about how you compose the concurrent um, aspects of the, um, the problems that you're, you're working on. Um, now, I know that was a bit of a um, whirlwind tour, um, but, you know, hey, it's 45 minutes and we're trying to cover the whole concurrency and parallelism landscape. Um, I want to come back to those, those three key messages which I, which I wanted to, um, to talk about beginning to, at the beginning of the, the talk. Parallelism is more than multiple cores. Multiple cores are, in, are important, absolutely, but there's a lot more to parallelism than just multiple cores. Parallelism and concurrency aren't the same things, and thinking about them differently is a very useful exercise when you're faced with a problem. Make sure that you're thinking about concurrent problems in a concurrent mindset and thinking about parallel problems in a parallel mindset. And finally, actors are a great way to write current programs, concurrent programs. They're not the only way to write concurrent programs. There are other well-motivated, well-thought-out ways of, of putting together concurrent programs. And with that, we'll move to questions. Yes, sir. Oh, of course. Yeah, I was wondering when you compare the CSD model with the actor model, mm -hmm. that uh, wouldn't it be possible, like you see, to implement the same thing in the actor model by having a channel actor? So I. I as I said at the beginning, I'm not suggesting in any of these, these cases that um, any of these are either better than the Erlang way of thinking about it or that you couldn't find a way of 
doing the same kind of thing in, in Erlang. Um, this is, this is um, as with all of these, these conversations that you have about one language versus, versus another language, it's far more to do with emphasis and mindset. Because the way, the way that you tend to think about things if you come at a problem from an actor kind of mindset is these independent entities that, that kind of work on things in, on their own right and have, um, uh, have their own addresses. That kind of shapes the, the, the type of program that you come up with. Um, so actually, I'm just going to go back and show you this, this diagram again. One of the things that you can do very easily with, with CSP is, as well as having... Um, multiple things writing to a channel, you can also have multiple things reading from a channel. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't have an example that I can show you of that, but there are, there are ways in which that changes the kind of programs that you typically are likely to come up with. Um, so one of the really nice things that's supported by um, both Corded Async, which is what I was showing you there, and also Go, is the concept of a reified timeout. Now, a reified timeout is a, uh, a channel that will have a value written to it. It actually doesn't matter what the value written to it is, just a value written to it after some period of time. And because it's a real thing, it's a, it's a channel um, which you can pass around, you can pass that timeout around to multiple different things. So if you imagine you've got, say, a sequence of 10 things you want to happen, and you don't want each individual one to timeout, you want a timeout for the whole thing, you create this reified timeout right at the beginning of what you're doing, and then you pass it down to all of these things, and all of them, whenever they read from any channel, they read from the channel they're interested in and this timeout, and if the timeout fires, then the whole thing times out. Um, could you put something like that together in, in Erlang? Yeah, I'm sure you could, but would you think of putting it together like that in Erlang? I'm not so sure. And that, that I think, is the value of this stuff. Is it's just a, it's a way of, of giving you additional um, mental toolkits to tackle problems. Yes? Yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> ah, so so this actually is one of yes. So this actually is one of the nice things about um, about CSP, um, which unfortunately again I wasn't really able to show you, is that the flow control is built in. So actually, that that sieve is pretty much data flow. Um, so the thing which is generating numbers at the beginning will only generate numbers as fast as all of the things downstream from it can consume those numbers. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't run out of memory because it, it's kind of profligate in channels, but it, it certainly won't run out of memory for that reason. Anyone? Yes. Uh, yes, I guess so. So, so we're getting kind of into the into the minutiae here. But, but in in modern CSP languages, um, what you can create are two different types of channels. There are synchronous channels and there are asynchronous channels. Is is the jargon? I mean, they're all asynchronous, really. But uh, yeah, well, so so this is the interesting thing: is that that the asynchronous channels have a limit. So you'll say this channel can hold up to 10 things or 100 things or, or whatever it might be. Actually, if you do that, you don't get this nice uh, feature that we were just talking about. So the majority of channels in, in most CSP um, programs actually have zero elements in them. They have that there is no room in the channel at all. It isn't a buffer in any shape or form. It, but at the time that you write something to the channel, you unblock anything that's waiting on that channel. And if there's nothing waiting on the channel, the person who's writing into the channel blocks. Yeah, but at least in Go, I mean, you can write the buffer full, but after that, the producing process will stop until, until it takes something away. It, it depends. I mean, there's, there's, there's different... Sorry, carry on. Thank you.